Trail and Ultra Runners, what is going on? What's happening? Welcome to another episode of the Coopcast. As always, I'm your humble host, Coach Jason Coop. And on this episode of the podcast, we have a very special guest, someone whose work has influenced my coaching career a tremendous amount, very specifically in the sport of ultra running. And that is Guillaume Mie, who I will call Guy from now on. And I'm sorry for, for totally butching your name, Guy. You knew I was going to do that. I mentioned it to you during the recording. But Guy has this incredible mix of being an endurance athlete himself, in particular an ultra marathon athlete doing some of the hardest races in the world, including UTMB and the Tour de Giant. And he's also a researcher who has contributed greatly to our understanding and our framework within ultra marathon running and how different things impact performance. However, this podcast takes a really interesting turn where I'm talking to a physiologist, somebody who has a physiology background, and we start discussing a lot of the psychological elements of trail and ultra running. It was a really fun conversation. I hope to have him back on the podcast during a future episode. So here we go. We're going to get right into it and I'm going to get right out of the way. Here is my conversation with Guy. So Guy, you don't, you don't know this. I'm going to spring this on you right now, but I'm going to tell a quick story about the way that I was introduced to some of your work. Um, it was actually through a mutual colleague of mine in 2015. And um, I just started to kind of work with ultra runners more on like a more permanent basis. And I was going through this process where I was trying to figure it all out, as you're really well aware of like this whole proposition, this is what we're going to talk about on the podcast, this whole proposition of, of determining what the limiting factors are in ultra marathon running. It, mm -hmm. It's a really unknown subject, especially when we compare it to some of the traditional endurance sports like cycling and marathon running and things like that. And one of my colleagues sent me this YouTube video, and I say the word video lightly because I think it's just the audio from you actually giving this presentation at the Endurance Research Conference in 2015. And I think this is when you were still in Canada. And um, I listened to it, and for the listeners of this podcast, I'm going to put a link to this YouTube video in the show notes because it's incredibly insightful. But it was the first time that I, as a coach, I like it was as if the stars had all aligned, where I could finally say, "Yes, this is these these are the answers that I have that I have been seeking to help guide me in how to train athletes for an for an ultra marathon." So much so, and this is a compliment to you, that for any of our new coaches that come in, our coaches that are fresh out of undergraduate or graduate school or whatever, one of the very first pieces of continuing education that I give them is that presentation. And it's, okay. it's brilliant. It goes through the whole thing. And one of the linchpins in it, which is kind of what we're going to start out with, is that how running economy might not be that important in ultra marathon running as compared to regular marathon running where we do everything possible to try to maximize running economy. This is one of the points that you were trying to make. Ultra runners carry more muscle mass. We use poles in certain, uh, certain situations that might impact running economy. And so for me to you, just to start out with that presentation, I don't know if you remember or not, had an incredible <laughs> influence on my like early ultra marathon coaching career. Well, first, uh, thank you. I appreciate the compliments. Uh, I am actually not sure which uh, talk you're talking about <laughs> because I've probably done uh, I've done many presentations, probably too many, some people would say. No, I'm joking. But uh, so 2015, I was in Canada. So yeah, I can't remember exactly. Was it in Chamonix or was it in Calgary? I, I think remember. it was actually in Calgary. Um, in Calgary, yeah, but I, I okay, can't maybe that was the talk I uh, gave in at CSEP, the Canadian Society for Exercise Physiology. Act. Okay, anyway, so thank you for the compliment. <laughs> well, it made it made a big impact on me. You might not remember it, but but I do. And like I said, all the all the coaches that I work with, they're they're very familiar with you and your work. Um, one of the things I want to get into with the listeners um, is this overall framework that you presented. I believe is in twenty eleven or twenty twenty twelve of what are the determining factors of ultramarathon running? 
and it's the way that I can verbally describe something that was that is very visual in this pa in this paper that you presented is this spider web of all of these different factors that are intertwined with each other that affect ultramarathon performance. There's GI distress, there's uh, muscle and tissue damage, there's psychological and motivational factors, and this whole, this, this whole array of things that I think is important to start to conceptualize. So why don't we start, start out first by talking about how you first started that, how you first started that conceptualization and what are some of the key points of that particular piece of research and of that particular figure in that research that ultra runners can 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 take away from? Um, I'm not too sure when I ended up uh, <laughs> writing this uh, this figure. Uh, I, yeah, I guess it's um, it was not the, the the beginning, but it was uh, not too far after I started to work on on ultra marathon. So I was. I, I, as you said, I was like, okay, so there's not enough, uh, not much in the literature about the determining factors of performance in ultra. And uh, so we probably need something uh, slightly different compared to the, the classic uh, three component view two max, uh, endurance and egg running economy. And uh, I ended up working, uh, I mean, publishing this uh, actually was a viewpoint in journal applied physiology. And that was this, uh, this uh, figure in it. Uh, and I guess it's not only based on my uh, uh, scientific publications or knowledge, but it was a, a combination of uh, field experience and, and scientific considerations. And of course, not only my, my work, but uh, other people's work as well. Um, so yeah, and it's, it seems actually, it may seem it is a complicated, figure or picture, but it's actually uh, much less complicated than it should be. I mean, the in the reality, the athletic performance, especially in ultra, is much more complicated than this figure. <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you want to, to start talking about the, the, the different factors that, that are in that figure, but there are, there are many, many, but not enough. For instance, uh, there are factors such as sleep deprivation or pacing. It's not directly in the, in the figure. Uh, it's not directly on the graph, and it, and it should be. Uh, but that was, uh, I guess, uh, complicated enough. <laughs> Even so, the, the pacing, the pacing can be partly put in the psychological and motivational factors. Uh, this is this is related, but not. I could have had uh, uh, pacing as another factor per se. And for the listeners out there, what we are describing is a figure from what Guy produced maybe ten years ago now. <laughs> And that figure is a flow chart that describes how all of these individual components of performance. So uh, for, as I was mentioning earlier, gastrointestinal distress, uh, perhaps uh, energy depletion, motivational factors, how they all interplay with each other and then ultimately result in ultramarathon performance. If you contrast that with what we see in marathon performance, it boils down to three very simple variables. The athlete's VO2 max, the fraction of that VO2 max that they can sustain throughout the course uh, of a marathon, and the oxygen cost or the energy cost of running, depending upon how, how you're actually looking at it. What, we're, what, what that figure is essentially demonstrating is there's a, this whole host of variables that actually go into it. But what are, the, what are the main ones? I mean, you mentioned that you tried to distill even that figure, which I still think is complicated, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. You tried to distill that figure down into things that are uh, that 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 might be more apparent that might be more apparent or a, sim a simplified version of it. What are the major ones, though? What are the major points of consideration that athletes should be taking from that? It's it's difficult to say that there are factors more important than others than others. Uh, if you want to be a, a top athlete, you need to consider all of them. But uh, I'll try to, to answer your question anyway. Um, I would say that VO2 max, even so this is uh, super long, and even so you can sometimes run or walk at uh, as low as 40% of your VO2 max during, during an ultra. I would say that VO2 max is still, still important, not, not for 
not of course because you are you are running close to view to max, but if, because if you run at a given speed and you have a high view to max, obviously you are running at a lower percentage of your view to max. And we know that there are positive consequences of, of that. For instance, you are using more fat. So this is a simpler one, but still I think relevant one. Uh, if you are at uh, if you start an ultra and you are you, you need to to follow the best runners, you need to be at seventy percent of your view to max. You are going to use lots of your uh, glycogen, and of course you cannot run for very long at that speed because of that reason. In partly because of that reason, so view to max is still is still important, and I I guess science show that. But the 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 most uh, obvious I guess uh, proof of that is someone like uh, Kilian John. He is probably uh, one of the athletes with the highest view to max in the world. Uh, and this is not the only reason why he's so good, but this is one reason for sure. Okay, so view to max. So any prolonged events, you need a high view to max. So this is common with any endurance sport. You still need... Still, you still need... Still, 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 still neutral. Exactly. It's still in the endurance yeah. domain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's ultra endurance, but it's endurance. Um... Okay, and then actually all the factors, more or less, but uh, all the factors are common to shorter distances, but some are more important in long, in longer events than others. Uh, for instance, uh, even so, I'm a physiologist, so I don't know much. Uh, I acknowledge for sure that the the mental training part is actually super important in ultra. Um, this is um, crucial. Definitely crucial, and this is probably something that was uh, one of my weaknesses when I was a, a runner, uh, the, the mental aspect. And I tried to, I tried to work on that with one of my friends uh, who was a, a mental coach, and he helped me. Uh, but um, I, I, I think this is the, the longer the distance, uh, the more important it is. And I think I, I, I really like now that I'm ten years after the end of my career, uh, I feel like, okay, I should have done more on that. Definitely, I should have uh, spent more time uh, doing this mental training thing. So again, I can't say much more on that because this is not my uh, area of expertise, but I still believe uh, that this is, this is actually super important. But I, I want all the listeners, before you keep, continue to go through this, I want all the listeners to appreciate the fact that you as a physiologist, that's your bias, right? It's the physiology of performance. You were saying that even within your own running career, you could have spent more time working on the mental game. I think that that says a lot because you're taking something that is not within your normal you know, wheelhouse to think about and saying, hey, this is super important and even, and even I screwed it up. All the listeners yeah. should all the listeners should take note of that because I think that that's, that is really powerful and it just goes to it just goes to demonstrate how important, as you said, that component is in an ultra marathon context, particularly as compared to a marathon or a shorter endurance event context. Yes, but knowing that is important. Then, of course, the the next point, next uh, step is uh, what what can you do what with you that. Do. I still believe that there is a, a large part of, uh, of it, like a pain tolerance that is innate. Uh, you have it or you don't have it, but still, you can you can work on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and of course, it's not all about pain tolerance, but uh, part part of it is pain tolerance. Uh, anyway, so you you need to, to work on it. And the problem is that there are, maybe it's less true now than it, than that it was uh, ten years ago. Um, but the the problem I think is that there are not that many mental coaches. There are, I don't know in the US, but in France, there are, there are more now you have a, a diploma uh, with like on that, uh, including at the university. Uh, but it's, uh, it's not that easy to find a good mental coach that actually you also need, not, not only you need a mental coach, but you need a mental coach that knows, who knows the, the discipline. And this is not that easy to find. Anyway, it will come. And, and okay, then you need to find a coach and need, you need to accept to spend time, including maybe some time to spend time uh, at the expense of running. And I don't think many runners are ready to do that. Ooh, that's and, a tough proposition. I think, I, 
I think they should. <laughs> That's a tough proposition, especially for ultra runners, because we like to train and we like to be in the mountains. But what you're proposing is, is that we might need to actually take a little bit off the top of the physical training that we do in order to do some of the mental training. I had no idea this conversation was going to go this way, Guy. I thought we were going to talk about <laughs> physiology the whole time. All of a sudden, we started diving into psychology. <laughs> That's okay. Let's talk about physiology. It's more my domain. yeah. So let's get let's get back to it. So you kind of hit some of the be, the heavy hitters, right? VO two max is kind of the king or queen maker, right? You still have to have a super high VO two max to be extremely successful in ultra marathon yes. events. What else below that would you say are some of the other physiological heavy hitters? So the second obvious one is endurance. So endurance uh, with the, the, the right definition of endurance, which is the ability to sustain a high percentage of your VO2 max, right? And so this is, of course, endurance, having a good endurance is important uh, for any distance. Like even if you're on a 10K, you need a high endurance. Uh, but compared to ultra, this is the same word, but this is not the same determining factors of endurance. So for instance, for if you run a half marathon or even marathon, you need a good anaerobic threshold. So you need to be able to, 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 be, to, to have your anaerobic threshold or your critical velocity close to your VO2 max. In ultra, I, I don't think we care that much about the anaerobic threshold. What we care about in ultra is, in my opinion, it can of course be discussed, but there are two main points. The first one is your ability to resist to muscle damage or lower limb tissue damage. Uh, and the second point is we already started to talk about, or you already started to talk about that, is uh, GI distress. So those two points are super important to be able to run for 10, 20, or 40 hours, or even more if you're running the Tour de Gion. So let Tour de Gion, <laughs> for those of you that, that, that are, uh, uh, you guys, everybody missed our off-air conversation. We were talking a little about, about Tour de Gion before we jumped on the podcast. Maybe we could use that as a little bit of a case in point of what I want to talk about now, which is a lot of this muscular damage that occurs. And all ultra runners and mountain runners will be familiar with this sensation of having dead legs towards the end of a race, especially races that have a lot of vertical gain, in particular vertical descent. And we see this we see this amount of muscle damage pop up in the physiology of runners when we when we uh, when we poke and prod them after races or sometimes during races, which is some of the research that, that you that you've been involved in. Let's kind of first to des describe how that damage, like what that damage actually looks like, like what's going on at the level of the of the muscles, and then we can talk about potentially some training strategies to mitigate it because that's ultimately what people are interested in is how do we prevent these things in the first place. But what does that look like physiologically when we start to see some of this muscle damage damage crop up in ultra runners? So this is, uh, as you said, this is related to. Um, to the repetition of a micro or eccentric contraction. Uh, even so, it's probably true that in downhill you have more downhill uh, you have more uh, muscle damage, but in ultra you are running, uh, of course, super slowly, and uh, or at least you should even even in the first uh, downhills. And if you do that, you may be able to minimize uh, muscle damage so that in the end. Uh, flat ultra and ultras with uh, elevation, lots of elevation and lots of downhills. In the end, I'm not sure the the consequences in terms of muscle damage uh, are that different. Uh, but anyway, so uh, either flat or uh, ultras with uh, lots of elevation, you at some point you will get some uh, some uh, muscle damage. And the difference with the uh, shorter distances is that. This is so long that you start to feel the consequences of this muscle damage during the race. If, if you do, a, let's say, a 30 minutes downhill run, only 30 minutes, or even less, 15 minutes, full speed, uh, this is not such an issue. You will get massive muscle damage, even in 15 minutes, if you go full speed downhill, uh, but you don't care because you will feel the consequence in the, the hours or the days after the race. But in your trial, you will, you will feel the consequences during the race, and this consequence is the inflammation that start to to take place to repair your your muscle damage. Uh, 
Uh, it's, I guess it's not only the, the muscle, it's also tendon and, and all basically all tissue in the lower limbs, but let, let's call that muscle damage. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is not good because inflammation is painful, as you said. And in the end, uh, I don't know if we have time to, to talk about the flush model, but in the end, everything is, uh, is under the supervision of the brain. And of course, the brain, the, the main factors that, <laughs> that uh, trigger the, the brain response is the, the perception of effort or pain or both. Mm, okay, so the listeners will remember a really great podcast I had several weeks ago with uh, Roger Anoka, and we talked about a lot about neuromuscular fatigue. So since you brought it up, we're gonna go we're gonna go down there. I always feel that when we start to talk about areas of the brain, though, that people automatically tune out because neurophysiology is incredibly complicated. The vocabulary is even weird to work around. And people start to tune. We can out. make it simple. We can make it simple. <laughs> we can make, make it simple. simple. Let's make it simple, then, Guy. So <laughs> let's, what let's is talk about cables and stuff like that, and people will understand. Let's make it simple. What is neuromuscular fatigue, and why? How does it show up in ultramarathon running? Okay, so neuromuscular fatigue uh, is can be defined as a reduction in maximal performance. That's a very basic, but still, I think, valid definition. For instance, if you measure force before the race and immediately after the race, uh, you will, of course, observe a, a decrease. And what we observe is that depending on the duration, you, you have a kind of a nonlinear increase of this uh, force uh, strength off, uh, and it plateaus for like 100 miles or even probably a bit shorter, 100K maybe it plateaus around 35 to 40% of your maximal force, initial maximal force. Uh, this is valid for the quadriceps and the, the plantar flexors, the calves. Roughly, it's uh, 35 to 40% in average, of course. Right. Um, and we have done several studies and we consistently show that. So I think this is, uh, we, I think we can accept this. Uh, this before, before you go on though, Let's describe the studies because people are going to appreciate how you actually get this data, a lot of which you've collected at uh, the Ultra Trail de Mont Blanc. Just how, what's the setup of it? Because so, I think that that will help under, I think that will help the listeners understand what is actually going on at the level of the muscle if they understand what the actual research protocol is. Very, very simply, very simply put, like what did you have the subjects go through? Yeah. Well, it depends which study you're talking about, because I've been publishing on Ultra for uh, since uh, 2003, uh, me meaning that I'm old. So that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> so, but and we have done. Now, the reason I'm saying that is that we have done both labs and and field studies. The field and studies. Actually, that's what I was referring uh, to. Yeah. Okay. Field field studies. Yep. Because we also we also did a, a, a study. I, I think this is this is nice to or, or maybe not nice, but fun to to tell to your listeners, we, we have done a study when, which consisted in having uh, 14 people running 24 hours on the treadmill. Yeah. So, so I don't know if you, uh, maybe you have not, you have not seen that. I will no, send you I've the people. That that, 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 it, was, it was so fun. Yeah. Anyway, so this, this is uh, usually when you, in, when you want to study ultra and to go back to your question, yeah, we go uh, on the race uh, and we've done mainly UTMB, but also another race that is probably less known in, uh, abroad, uh, which called, but it's super known in France. It's called La Grande Course des Templiers. It's a shorter race. It's only 65 or 120K, so it's not 100 miles. But uh, still, actually, my first study was uh, uh, at this race. And I want to take the opportunity, if you have two sec, uh, Jason, to, to thank the organizers. So both uh, the organizers of the Templier, Odile and Gilles Bertrand, and the organizers of the UTMB, Catherine and Michel Poletti, because without those guys, uh, we cannot go and, and do our studies. So they, they have been super helpful. So I just wanted to thank them. 100%. Anyway, so uh, to answer your question, finally, uh, we go there, we recruit people, of course, ahead of the race. Uh, most of the times we test them the, in, the, in the lab the months before the race. And then, so it's the first visit. Then they come uh, at the race and we have our lab uh, close to the finish line. Okay, starting and finish line. And we test them in the two days before the race. So we have the, the initial values uh, 
okay? And then they do the race. We usually, we don't do anything. We may want, we may sometimes record like heart rate or GPS or stuff like that, but usually we don't do much during the race. And then after, uh, immediately after they are done with the race, they come back to our, our lab, which is a lab in the field. <laughs> uh, so at the UTMB, it's, uh, they need probably five minutes to walk to the, to the lab. And then we test them again as soon as possible. It takes time, but uh, of course, you do not recover in, 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 in five or 10 or 20 minutes after a race like the UTMB. So we test them after the race, and the fatigue is the difference between the pre- so measure within the two days before the race and the post, which is immediately after the race. And what you're asking them to do is something maximal. I think that that shouldn't get lost, right? You're asking them to do some sort of maximal voluntary yeah. contraction or maximal force, both before and after running a race like A or UTMB. Yeah, and plus we do uh, stimulation, like electrical stimulation, so we we shock them with electricity or magnetic field uh, at the cortical level. So we put a, a coil uh, on the motor cortex and or sometimes we ask them to do a, a sprint on the bike, uh, six or eight second sprint. So we are, we are, we are not nice. That's for sure. but they, 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 they come back, so they should enjoy that. Uh, the, see, that's what I was trying to, that's what I was trying to get at. You're asking them to do all this really hard invasive stuff right after they finished a really difficult race. So kudos to the volunteers for this, but it, it does really illuminate a lot of things that we previously didn't know in ultra running. And one of the things is just what you mentioned is it's, it seems to be that this amount of force decline plateaus off after a certain point meaning we get to a certain point in a race and you don't from from at least that one perspective that you are measuring it doesn't seem to get all that much worse why do you think that that is so i was saying that uh, if you consider fatigue as a reduction in maximal strength the conclusion could be that it's a uh, less fatiguing to, to run 200 miles than 100 miles. Nobody's so, going to believe you on that, by the way. That's, that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, this is, no, as I said, this is one of the limitations of, the, of our, our definition, uh, because of course it takes more time to recover after the turn. The but um, anyway, they, the, the, probably the reason for that is that uh, during the Tour de Jean, you stop to sleep. At least most of the runners, they, they stop to sleep, which is not the case for, the, for a shorter race. Uh, anyway, so yeah, this is, uh, we ask them to do maximal, maximal contractions. And this is, as I said, the, the definition of fatigue, of neuromuscular fatigue. So is it fair to say, Guy, that in your estimation, is neuromuscular fatigue specifically one of the primary culprits of overall performance decline in ultra running? Uh, of course, it plays a role. It, it, is, it is important, uh, but actually, it cannot explain all the performance deterioration in rain. And this is actually the re the reason why I, I uh, decided to to go with this uh, flush model, uh, because I, uh, when I published this uh, flush model paper in sports medicine, I had already published quite a few papers on on neuromuscular fatigue, and I was like, okay, as a runner, there is there is some not wrong. Not, I cannot say that there is something wrong. But there is it now. It doesn't explain everything. So we need we need something broader, larger, <laughs> to, to explain performance. But definitely, neuromuscular fatigue is part of it, and particularly the 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 central components. So the central components, uh, the central fatigue, is um, the inability of the central nervous system to drive the muscle. And Maybe I can take two secs to, to explain that. Uh, so how can we determine that? Simply by using electricity. So we ask the subject to, do, to contract their muscle maximally. And when they reach their maximal force, we superimpose an electrical shock. And we examine the response, the force response. If you're able to increase the force a lot, it means that the subject was not able to fully drive his muscle or her muscle. And uh, usually before the race, there is no, no increase. It's, uh, they, are, they are in good health, they are trained, so they are able to, to recruit everything, all, every single f muscle fiber is recruited before the race. But after the race, not only the muscle fibers are damaged or fatigued, but the central nervous system is also fatigued, meaning that 
uh, the, the, the muscle fibers that are in bad shape, they are not fully drived anymore. And we, so after the race, when we stimulate, of course, the force, when they, they try to do the max, the force is much lower. So as I said, 40% lower. But then when we stimulate, we're able to increase the force more than, I mean, no, not more in terms of absolute force, but uh, we can clearly see a superimposed force, meaning that the, the brain was fatigued. I don't know if, I, if it was clear, but this is actually quite important to 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 consider that the, it's not only it's not all about muscles. It's uh, actually after an ultra, and especially ultra running. This is less true in cycling, but after ultra running, uh, the the central nervous system really suffers, and maybe one of the reasons why the the brain that it's not the brain, it's the central nervous system, but let let's call it the brain. Uh, is not able to fully drive the muscle anymore. Is to maybe to protect the body, right? Because we are so, we are so fatigued that uh, okay, I don't. It's like okay, I don't want to to push more than this is. This is like too dangerous for the for the body. Of course, this is uh, an interpretation, but uh, the reality is that we have a, a huge what we call central fatigue or neural fatigue. And the way that just to describe that in another way for the listeners, the way that you're trying to figure out if central fatigue is playing a factor is you you're inducing an electrical stimulus while you're asking the athlete to produce a maximal voluntary contraction. So you're essentially finding out what part of the force decline is responsible for central fatigue by subtraction, right? Because you're exactly. introducing it after the fact. Yeah. When we want to examine the muscle fatigue, so there are two parts, the central fatigue and the muscle or peripheral fatigue. Okay. Uh, to, to, it is quite easy to measure muscle fatigue, meaning that you don't want to have the influence of the brain. You just as a subject to relax and you stimulate the muscle. And you, you do that before and after the race, as I explained. And of course, after the race, when you stimulate at the same intensity, the force response is lower, and this is due to muscle fatigue. So, Guy, we, we got off on a little bit of a tangent talking about neuromuscular fatigue and, this, and the differences between central and peripheral fatigue and how we're measuring it. But what we originally wanted to talk about was, mu was muscle damage. So let's backtrack a little bit. We know anybody who has done an ultramarathon knows that there's a tremendous amount of muscle damage that goes on because you can see people hobbling around after races and they're just sore and they're just kind of a mess. But we know that there's actually like a clinical way that we can look at this where we use biomarkers that indicate muscle damage, primarily CPK. Uh, and we measure this after races, but how does that actually impair function? So we have all this muscle damage. What is the performance consequence of that while that while the runner is actually running an ultramarathon, which could be you know a day or several days in length? Well, first of all, I don't think a CPK is a, is a good index of uh, muscle damage. I know this is uh, uh, the, the index that uh, everyone uses, uh, but this is very imperfect. Um, but we don't have uh, much better ways to, to right. assess it. So, okay, let's go with blood sample. Um, anyway, uh, the, the, the technique that I explained, the, the muscle stimulation is another way to examine indirectly uh, muscle damage slash fatigue. Um, anyway, so the question is, uh, why is it important? Um, and sorry, I will have to, to go back to the flush model again because, and, and we'll come back to the muscle damage in a, in a minute, but uh, this is not, in my opinion, this is not a, a direct consequence of muscle damage because even so the, the muscles are, are really damaged uh, after a neutral, especially if you're not like super well prepared. Uh, you, they are still in good, relatively good shape. If I go back to, to my 40% decrease in, in maximal voluntary contraction, okay, 40% seems a lot and it's a lot actually. But uh, you can also consider that you still have 60% of your maximum. And with 60% of your maximum, you can run quite fast. Right. And much, much faster than what people do during, during the race. So the, the, the problem of muscle damage is not the damage itself, it's the inflammation and the pain. And you are not running faster, not because your muscle cannot do faster. You are running 
slower, you're, you're, you're decreasing your speed simply because your brain is telling you to do that because if you, you know that if you keep going at that pace, this is going to be super painful and you are not able to tolerate that pain for the rest of the race. So you, you, you pace yourself to be able to, to reach the finish line. So it's not a so this function. Is really, this is, this is really, sorry, this is really why you need to minimize muscle damage is to minimize the pain. So it's not a functional problem, it's a perceptual oh. problem. Which, which, which are related, of course. Right. Because the perceptual is related to the functional, to the function. Mm. So if you are able to minimize the, the, the muscle damage, then you will improve performance. And when you were talking about uh, running economy uh, a while ago now, <laughs> uh, and saying that uh, I said that running economy is not that important, this is not... I don't think this is what I said. I think what I said is that there is a kind of a trade-off between running economy and endurance, and in particular, muscle damage. That's, this is so important that sometimes you need to sacrifice, and that was actually the title of the paper. Can we sacrifice running economy to improve overall performance? And this is the point. This is so important that you may need, or it's not that you may, that you need to do everything you can to reduce muscle damage. And sometimes this is at the expense of running economy. Let's, let me give you a couple of examples if, if this is clear. Is, is that clear? Yeah, 100%. What I'm thinking okay. of is, is like this hierarchy. It's almost like a hierarchy of performance needs where preventing muscle damage is just higher on that chain versus running economy. That's the way I view it. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a fair comparison, I think. Uh, okay, so a couple of examples where you may need to sacrifice uh, running economy to improve overall performance, basically to improve endurance. If you minimize muscle damage, you improve endurance. Of course, you are not in, going to improve your VO2 max, but you improve your ability to run at a given percentage of your VO2 max for a longer period, basically. Uh, one is uh, poles, using poles. We know that this is, even so now, they are super light, uh, but still, using poles probably uh, worsen a little bit your running economy. But this is so nice to minimize the, the load that you put on your legs that I actually don't understand, of course, if this is allowed by the, the rules. But if this is, I don't understand why people are not using them. Uh, maybe this is not true for Kilian Jonet, but for 99% of the, the runners, this is true. Because you are able to, to, to share the, the loads, the workload between the, from the legs to the upper body. And Anytime you do that, it can only be positive for the overall performance. This, this, is, my, this is my opinion, at least. Uh, another example, which is, and the poles are probably the best example, but other examples are, for instance, flexibility. We know that if we are too flexible, uh, this is not good for running economy. And I'm not saying that people should... <laughs> I, I've never said that. Uh, but this is true that if you are too flexible, um, at some point, this is going to deteriorate your running economy. But this is probably a good thing for your ability to minimize muscle damage because you, you tend to, to, how can I say that, to smooth a little bit the, the, the peak force at each stride. Uh, and there is no like super clear evidence, but I, I, believe, I believe in it. I believe this is true. Uh, another example is running shoes. You may want to, of course, if you're in a marathon, you want super light shoes, right? For a neutral marathon, yeah, maybe this is uh, this is more debatable. Uh, it's not uh, it's not really in terms of um, like muscle damage, but maybe in terms of comfort. If you you need you need very comfortable shoes if you're on a neutral, and even if they are a bit heavier than, than lighter shoes, uh, that that's okay. I think you need to accept that. And okay, you are going to to deteriorate a little bit your running economy, but if this is, again, this is a, a trade-off that you have to make to, to improve your performance overall. RPE is so important in the end. So if muscle damage is one of the more important considerations to try to prevent in order to maximize ultra-running performance, aside from the flexibility piece that you mentioned earlier, what are some of the training components that you feel that runners should be taking on during their day-to-day, month-to-month training in order to prepare them to mitigate all of this muscle damage that's going, going to occur? 
it's pretty simple actually, and everyone does that. But uh, you really need to to emphasize that this is very very important. It's uh, running downhill. <laughs> you, you just need to accumulate. You accumulate. You need to accumulate a negative uh, elevation. That there is. You can do strength training. You can do some eccentric training in the training room. That that helps for sure. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, you want to do specific specific training and specific training downhill in particular. That's your heavy this is why I, uh, This is why I proposed uh, many years ago. I don't think this is famous in the US, but in France, it's, it's quite famous what I call the shock weekend. The shock weekend is that you have to go, if you prepare a race like the UTMB, for instance, and, and you don't live in the Alps, at some points you need to go and, and probably you better go several times in the months before the race in the Alps or in a place in the mountains at least, and to do two or three days. This is why I call that a shock weekend, because usually you go in the weekend to, to, to really shock your muscles. And, and by shocking, I mean running downhill and doing thousands and thousands of meters of uh, downhill running. Uh, there is no, no other way to, to prepare your muscle. And if you do that, you will benefit from what we call the repeated bout effect. And we know that this is actually the, the first adaptations are quite quick, but then you, you need to do more than one time for sure. Uh, and then after that, it's uh, probably less obvious, but you will keep increasing your, your resistance to muscle damage. And there are, we could, we could uh, go into details about the reasons why this is happening. But the main reason is probably that you simply um, strengthen your, what we call the cytoskeletal and that basically the muscle fibers becomes stronger. Guy, we're, on, we're on the same page. And those of you that are not watching the YouTube version of this, I've got a you know grin on my face from ear to ear because we have talked about this a lot on, on this podcast. And it is one of the most common coaching questions that I get on a weekly basis. It's from athletes just in the situation that you described. I'm going to a mountainous race and I don't have mountains to train on. What do I do? And athletes are notorious for trying to contrive all of these different ways that they are going to cope with the downhill. They use box step ups and some use strength training and some running up and down stairwells. And I've always said that the most, the most effective way is to design a series or at least one training camp where you go out, you go on the mountains and you get all of that downhill running in a natural environment, that is going to be your heavy hitter in those situations. All of those other things, they might, you know, maybe they help a little bit around the edges, you know, that, that's going to be debatable, but try, try to be shaking his head right now. I'm, I usually shake my head when I see that as well. It might be a, a something's better than nothing situation, but maybe, but your heavy hitter, I guess is the point that I'm trying to make is try to get a training camp in a mountainous environment that is going to do a lot. Even if you can just do it for a few days or a couple of times yeah. for a few days. And, and I think a training camp is, is great, but if you can do several mini training camps, this is better yep. because you do those shock weekends. So you can call that a mini training camp, like a three days of training where you do these heavy loads and particularly downhill, uh, actually both uphill and downhill. Of course, if you run, you, you run ups and downs, uh, or you walk up, which is actually another point we can discuss. It's not muscle damage, but this is an, another super important point in my opinion. And this is another reason why you need, you need to do those, uh, those shock weekends. Uh, but anyway, if you do those shock weekends, you go three days, for instance, you do your training camp, then you recover. You take three weeks to recover so that you repair your muscle damage. You, they, they get stronger. Then for the next shock weekend, you can go faster because you are more resistant. So you can, you can push a little bit more, especially downhills. And then you get additional muscle damage. You repair and you, you get even stronger. Uh, more resistant, et cetera, et cetera. And he, here's, the, here's the important point for athletes is the first time you do one of those shock weekends, the overload is going to be achieved just by running downhill. You don't have to do anything special. You just run downhill because you're not, if you're not used to running downhill, just running downhill is going to be far. It might even be too much overload in some situations. Yeah, maybe uh, start by walking downhill. Yeah, there you go. Maybe yeah, the, exactly. Uh, maybe the, if you're if you're really uh, not super well prepared for a short weekend, you can still go and you do uh, basically hiking. Exactly. And that, that 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 may be enough. 
for the for the first one. Exactly, but here's what people want to do is they want to go out there and they want to bomb down the downhills because they've all seen the super sexy videos from Solomon where they're, you know, jumping off of rocks and, you know, careening downhill as fast as they can. They want to emulate that as much as possible. But from a training perspective. uh, Sorry. And then the second day, they won't be able to to uh, to walk anymore exactly exactly this is stupid so you need to even so this is only three days you still need to pace yourself for the first sometimes even two days is enough but you need to pace yourself for the first day so that you can do a lot the second day and maybe the at the end of the second day you can start to run because then that's okay you're done with the short weekend so you can you can you can run faster if you if you like or if you if you can which is a which may be the problem. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Enough about that. So we've got this, we've got this weekend is, or we've got this like plausible training scenario that we can set up for athletes that don't live in mountainous areas. They can go do a training weekend or a series of training weekends. I think that's a really, a really poignant way to do it that we can drive from the research. You've mentioned this a few times and I'd be remiss not to, to, to let you opine on this, uh, kind of as we conclude this podcast, but this is the flush model that you keep mentioning that the listeners are not going to be familiar with. If you're, if you're indoctrinated into the scientific literature and especially a lot of the work that you've done, Guy, we, that will, this is going to be a familiar term, but most of the listeners with all due respect to you, this is going to be totally foreign to them. So why don't you take them through this flush model that, um, uh, that you've mentioned a few times on this podcast and why is it relevant or why, why should it be relevant for ultra runners? Uh, sure. Uh, I'll try at least. So as I said, uh, I guess as a scientist, I, w- I could live with the neuromuscular fatigue as a runner. This is definitely not enough. So I needed something else. So I needed a, a very sophisticated model. So that's why I chose a, a flush toilet. Of course, I, I'm joking. And part of the reason I chose a, a, a flush toilet is because it was, uh, at least according to me, and uh, my wife would disagree. I thought it was funny. <laughs> I, it was funny. Uh, maybe it's not, but I, I, I thought it was funny. So I could have used another another tool, probably another model, but uh, I thought. Uh, the, the flush uh, toilet was a was a good one, and actually it's a, it's very appropriate. Anyway, so the the idea is to, as I said, I think performance is basically only determ- determined by the perception of effort. So as we just discussed, you need to do everything you go to do you can sorry to minimize muscle damage. It's not to minimize muscle damage per se. It's because you will minimize your rating of perceived exertion if you do that. You will have less inflammation and uh, the, the sensation from the muscle that are triggered or, or carried out by uh, what we call sensitive fibers will inform your brain less if you are able to preserve your, your muscles better. And again, one good, re- one good way to do that is, is training, or the, the best way to do that is training. Anyway, um, so everything is based on, on RPE, rating of perceived exertion, and in the model, RPE is actually the level of water in the tank okay mm. so basically the model says that everything you can do to minimize the what the level of water in the tank will improve performance and vice versa and it's not only what is happening during the race like we just described with the the muscle damage but also before the race because contrary to what most people will think you do not necessarily start the race with an empty tank Mm-hmm. Of course, as soon as you start running, you will see the the level of water increase because uh, because of fatigue, because everything you can imagine. Um, and it's not on, not only actually about pain that you see the RP increasing when you start to fatigue. It's also because since your muscle fibers start to be fatigued and, and damaged, to run at the same speed, you need to increase the number of muscle fibers that you recruit. Right, since less each single fiber produces less force, you need more to do the same. Right, so if you increase your your central command to your muscles, there is a copy to your to your uh, somatosensory brain or cortex that tells you, hey, this is this is more difficult. So there are both sides. There are the, this is what we call the feed forward mechanisms, plus of course the feedback coming from these uh, afferent fibers that I was talking about. So those two 
mechanisms together explains why you increase your LP when you start to be fatigued, right? So in other words, for the model, it means you start to increase the level of water in the tank. But to go back to my uh, first point, sometimes you don't start the race with an empty tank. And I don't know if you can guess what I have in mind, but uh, basically there are two good examples that are probably very similar. The first one is that mental fatigue is, is mental fatigue. So of course we are not asking anybody to, to do math before, before a new trial, but sometimes the week before you may have personal problems, right? You are not so because of your work or your family or whatever. Yeah, and this is going, this is still mental fatigue. So you're not very relaxed. And when you start running, you probably start with already some more difficulties than what you should be or you should do. And this is, uh, so basically it means that you, you start the race with some water in the tank. And of course it means that you are going to reach the, the top. And I go back to that in a minute. Uh, earlier, if you do that. And the second example, and it's probably even more relevant to, uh, to ultra, is sleep deprivation. Mm. We know that if you, there are many studies, uh, including some of our studies, that shows that if you are sleep deprived, uh, you will have, you will deteriorate performance, not because you are have a low of U2 max or any physiological impairments, but simply because you feel the exercise is harder. You have an increased RPE. So again, you start the the race with a with not an empty tank, and this is this is this is very bad. So this is so important that people they really need to. I guess most people they will understand that okay, I need to to sleep well the week before the race. But I think people underestimate how important it is. So I think people should do what we call sleep banking before a neutral marathon. This is very very important. And the model to go to go back to the flush model, the model also explains that. I could give you tons of other examples, but I think those are good examples. But I love the I love the fact that we're using a physiological consequence that you are seeing out in the field, right? Neuromuscular fatigue is a big deal in ultra running. We're using we're using that, which has been measured in the field and you've measured in the lab and measured in your lab that's in the field that we talked about earlier, to come up with really practical solutions for that that athletes can actually put into place. And that's bank sleep, right? Sleep. I, I have my athletes extend their sleep for two hours, usually uh, in the in the weeks leading before the race. Very smart. I'm not sure everyone does that. Yeah, I think that that's a really easy practical. And most people are trying to double down on their training at that time. That's usually what's the complicating factor. But this point of going from we see this happen in the race, how do we prevent it in training is really practical. We see neuromuscular fatigue happen in a race. How do we prevent it in training? One of the ways that we're going to prevent it in training is we're going to do camps like we talked about earlier. Another way that we're going to do it is in the days leading up to the race, we're going to sleep more and we're going to reduce the amount of stimulus that the athlete is having to kind of deal with in advance of the race. And I am thinking of the classic American that goes over to UTMB and gets completely overwhelmed by all of the hype and hoopla surrounding that race. There, it's a, it's a race unlike any other event that we have here in the U.S., and they get completely absorbed in everything that's going on in Chamonix. And what that does is it fills the, to use your analogy, it fills the tank up more, right? Exactly. Exactly. Wow. And uh, the last point, maybe if I can, if I may, um, is th this model also explained the, the mental training part that we were talking about. Because uh, another, another part of the model is that uh, the model says, it's not the model, it is the reality that you usually you don't die from running, right? You don't die from fatigue. So you have, you have what we call a security reserve. Basically, the water never overflows. Correct? Mm -hmm. And so this security reserve, if, you, if you're able to minimize it, then this is another way to improve performance. So you need to reduce the, the speed at which the level, will, uh, the level of water will increase in the tank, but you can also try to go higher. And by doing mental training, you, you, you also do that. If, you, if you're able to, to, basically what you want to do is to finish the race with the highest possible level of fatigue, not the lowest possible level of fatigue. 100%. If, if it makes sense. 
here's how I've described it to people, and this is based off of the research of uh, some uh, some sports psychologists that have long preceded it, any of us, is that your physiological capacity determines how much total work you can do, but your psychological skill set determines how much of that total capacity that you can actually tap into. And so when you're talking about the res- when you're talking about the reserve, which is the difference between the very top of the of the water tank and what you're actually what you're actually doing, the top of the water tank would be how much total physical capacity you have. How close you can get that water level to the very top has everything to do with the psychology that you can deploy during the race itself. Yeah, so the maximal capacity is what you will be able to do if you, if a bear runs after you. So this, is, <laughs> this is your maximum. But usually you don't do you don't do that much in even even in a race, even at the UTMB, if you're super motivated. I think you've just so this designed is, this, is, this is the limit. You've just designed your your uh, next field study right there. You're gonna introduce some <laughs> some sort I, I'm of. Not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure ethics will agree with that, but if they do. <laughs> uh, all right, Guy, this has been great, man. I'm gonna let you go we're gonna have to have you back on the podcast we could dive into more i had no idea this was going to take on just as much psychology as it was going to physiology and i think that says a lot for that particular field especially coming from somebody like you um i will have yeah yeah, there are are many things of course sorry to interrupt there are many things and actually uh when we when we prepare that you asked me to talk about uh running economy and and of course we could have talked uh about uh uh, running economy, biomechanics, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, we'll do that another day. <laughs> we, well, there's always more time, my friend. And uh, I'm glad I'm, I'm, I'm glad that you're now agreeing to come back on the podcast. The listeners will definitely uh, appreciate that. I'll have links in the show notes to everything that we talked about, all the research papers, and probably then some, including the initial uh, talk that where I was introduced to uh, your work. In addition to that, Guy, do you have anything for the listeners in terms of where they can find you or any research that is coming up that people can get involved in? Yeah, so I have a personal website. So it's uh, www.kinesiologi, so G-U-I dot uh, com. Uh, I, th- I believe this is com. Let me go I'll put a link to that in the <laughs> show notes too. <laughs> not, yeah, this is, this is, this is dot com. Uh, so they will find uh, like uh, all the scientific articles about ultra running uh, that I have published. Uh, it's a, it's free access. Uh, I'm not sure I'm supposed to do that, but uh, <laughs> <some of the papers. laughs> plus, uh, no, most of them are, are it's, it's, it's legal. I'm joking. And, uh, and additional, uh, videos. So some of them are in French, but, uh, most of them are, many of them are in English. So uh, I guess French English. Perfect. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so go to my website and they can also follow me on Twitter, which is, uh, uh kinesiology as well. Go follow Guy on Twitter. You're a good, you're a good Twitter Twitter follow. I have learned a lot from following you and also being a part of some of the banter that goes on in the threads. So I encourage people to do that as well. Guy, thank you very one, much. You got one, one more one, thing. So, yep. Sorry, wait, wait, one more thing. If if you allow me, I would like. Um, I hope people will. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if it will be very helpful, but I I would love to uh, have all the people listed in your notes. All the people that have worked with me. On, on, on all the different uh, research we were talking about listed in, in your notes, if, if I may. That is uh, because wonderful. I think this is, this is super important to acknowledge that uh, science is not is a teamwork. And uh, I, I think I, I want to do that if, you, if I can. 100%. Absolutely. Send me all the names and I will definitely put them on there. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you again, Guy. All right, folks, and there you have it. Much thanks to Guy for coming on the podcast today. We have to have you back. I could talk to him all day. I hope when I am over in that neck of the woods, hopefully this summer, we get to sync up for a trail run. I would much appreciate that. Appreciate the heck out of all the listeners today. If you have not already done so, go ahead over to Apple Podcast and give this podcast a rating or a review. It helps me spread the podcast a lot, and it also means a tremendous amount to me personally. I love it when I see those reviews come in. That's it for today, you guys. We will see you out on the trails.